Welcome everyone. Uh, today we will start our uh, next lecture under geriatrics. Uh, welcome to the Department of Medicine uh, lectures under DOMAP. Uh, this is the fourth of the uh, uh, last uh, last of the four lectures that we have under geriatrics. Today is will be by Dr. Sudhaika ma'am. Uh, she is a uh, head of the Department of Geriatrics with the CMC Mello. She is also the editor of the Journal of Indian Academy of uh, Geriatrics. Ma'am is a call, uh, member of the core group of medical education in our college and also present in modern distance education in geriatrics, which trains around 50 doctors per year. She also has various innovations under her, specifically, uh, we mentioned uh, since 2017 will be the ortho geriatric lyation, vascular surgery lyation. Ma'am also is part of our outreach clinics in uh, Chitur and uh, Rusa. She also is part of the CME and CNE, which is conducted every year. And she's also the organizing chairperson for Jericon 2019. Ma'am, thanks a lot for agreeing to take this lecture for our PG specifically. Um, and, uh, it's this PG online session we are conducting for this year because of this COVID per se. And today's topic is on discharge planning. Uh, we have a one, lect one hour lecture series for which if any doubts, you can put up in the chat box or ask ma'am directly. There might be questions through the lectures which might, might ma'am want to ask you in the middle of lecture or might be the end of lecture. So just stay tuned to the lecture. Um, thanks a lot. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Anju, for that introduction. So we'll plunge deep into the lecture. Uh, this is about discharge planning. You've had core geriatric topics before, which included delirium, dementia, and uh, movement disorders, which includes Parkinson's, which actually form uh, most of our bread and butter for geriatricians. Uh, can you name at least one department which doesn't have too much of discharge planning? You could write it on the chat. One, one uh, department which does not need to do much discharge planning. I can't read that. Radiology. Ray, no, no, it's a clinical department. Clinical department, Srikala. Clinical department. <laughs> clinical department, not non-clinical or paraclinical. Yeah, so I'm microbiology. <laughs> Okay, my friend is going to kill me because she's the head of this particular department. Obstetrics? Yes, <laughs> it's <laughs> obstetrics. They have nine months to prepare for discharge from the baby thing because they have to know where to keep the baby, who's going to look after the baby, do they have appropriate things for the baby. So we didn't need we don't need to get too involved in discharge planning for an obstetrics department. Okay, uh, so Hospital discharge is a complex and challenging process for healthcare professionals, patients, and their carers. And it needs to start at first contact with the hospital and to be standardized and embedded in practice with older people and their carers fully and promptly involved in their own discharge plans and goals. It is important that they are involved. That's the, that is the crux of the matter. If they're not, or, and if they're totally disconnected, they will not be in sync with the program that you have so carefully planned for them. They need to have personal involvement, they or their carers, or else your discharge planning will go for a six. Okay. The definition of discharge planning is when the patient or the carer or the family or any staff involved make necessary arrangements to ensure there's a smooth transition from hospital to home or a residential care facility. Two things must be kept in mind. What are the personal health goals? Number one of the patient, number two of the team involved. Patient may want to run the marathon, but that may not be possible because of his, multi, his or her multimorbidities. And there are follow-up tests and appointments, which you must keep in mind following discharge. Now their thoughts on discharge planning. There are challenges getting, first of all, staff. They are the most difficult people to get them to understand that discharge planning begins when the patient is admitted to hospital. They think admission is separate, uh, uh, what they do in the ward is separate and discharge is separate. No, it's a transition, so it has to go through phases. Somebody also mentioned that discharge planning appears to be more often about bed space than optimum provision of no, best care. Sorry. 
Okay. And we need to create a cooperative rather than a them and us approach, putting the needs of the patient first. It's not like Gauls against Romans. No, you should actually be part of that discharge planning and the patient's relatives need to be, ha uh, need to be seen as having to care for that patient. Now, older patients definitely have more complex discharge plans because they have myriad diseases, not only medical, it's social, financial, emotional, mental, and require more assistance in executing the necessary elements of their plan. Now, the admission assessment. I don't know if you've ever looked at a nursing or a nursing assessment. Have you ever seen a nursing assessment sheet of anybody? Uh, can you all tell me at least one assessment the nurse does? There are nearly 20 ongoing assessments the nurses do. Can you put that up in chat? One one assessment the nurse does in on admission of patient to a CMC below, medical admission. Triage. Triage, false risk, very good, excellent. Anybody else? Okay, there are so many assessments which includes actually skin integrity and other things that they keep on doing. They actually have a huge assessment. Just look at it and you will know so much more about your patient. And uh, that uh, they can also, they, they ask what is the diet they're on, their, their social situation, physiotherapy will uh, assess something else, along with assessing patients' capabilities and general safety conditions at home. They do a lot of assessments. Do not ignore their assessments. There are 20 pages, but they're a lifetime of what that patient has stored for himself. Now, each patient's discharge plan is uh, customized to their own particular situation. So when I am being discharged, will not be the same as when Anju is being discharged because our diseases are different. I'm a different person and I go to a different home. No, what are the goals of effective discharge planning? Basically, it is to improve the quality of life of a patient by ensuring continuity of care. It's not that patient came with typhoid, I gave him treatment for typhoid, full stop, tata, bye bye, see you next time or never again. No, it is actually a continuity of care and reduces the rate of unplanned readmissions. If you have not addressed certain issues, they come back as readmissions. Readmissions are those admissions within 30 days of the incident admission and or complications which may decrease the financial burden on the healthcare system, which may decrease. I'll come to this later. Now, the effectiveness of discharge planning how effective it is, have the, you actually reached what you wanted to? Is the output matching what you, have re, uh, what you have planned for this patient? It's difficult to evaluate due to the complexity of the intervention and the numerous variables involved. In the sense, patient may have chronic COPD with severe acute exacerbations. So because of that, he keeps coming into hospital, especially in winter. So you cannot say your discharge planning is bad. It's just that the disease is ongoing or a person with terminal cancer who comes in with uh, either electrolyte imbalance or severe breathing difficulty or whatever. And the quality of discharge planning correlates with a lower rate of readmission within 30 days. This is proven. Now, the quality of early discharge depends on the preparation made in the hospital prior to the patient's discharge. So all of us have to be prepared, not only the treating physician, the treating whole of the treating team, which has a huge amount of inputs from nursing, allied health, dietitian, social worker, and things like that. And But the cornerstone of a successful transition is one word, communication. Your communication must be very good with the patients, their relatives, and between the staff. See, the nurse can find out that this person is high risk for falls, or the nurse, uh, the, uh, the uh, physiotherapist can find out during uh, transferring the patient that they have developed a skin tear. Unless that is communicated between the professional staff, you're not going to get a, a, a good result because we don't know about it because I do not see the back of a patient and I don't know about it because I've never seen that patient working. 
at the core of the discharge planning is one person and that's the patient which includes his family so discharge planning is four terms it is dynamic it is a day-to-day -day basis it is collaborative between so many people i've mentioned it is interdisciplinary nobody is the queen or the king of your discharge if uh, i remember once when i was in australia i discharged a patient because the patient was medically stable to go the occupational therapist came to me and said excuse me you cannot discharge this patient his home is not ready for him so i had to cancel the discharge and it is interactive it is talking it is it is accepting what the other person says it is actually listening to what the other person has to say because you're dealing with a life you're not dealing with an inanimate object the discharge process as i said begins at admission for me history chief complaint breathlessness on exertion may be the chief complaint for me the discharge history also indicates why the patient is living who is he financially dependent on and who are his carers they may be a carer who physically supports him during the transfers or they may be a carer who financially supports him please enquire that in history otherwise you're not going to have a successful discharge process and physical examination goes on as you were taught from first clinical year onwards the needs of the patient is important of course when the patient uh, comes with a stroke he'll say i want to walk again but there are so many other unmet needs you have to look at take the patient to be your friend not a number or not a creatinine which is 3 please remember that they have feelings too and they have to be discharged to a safe haven now discharge planning varies from hospital to hospital who does it when is it done how it is done what kind of follow up is mandated whether the caregivers are assessed for their ability to provide the care that this patient needs and most importantly are they included as respected members of the discussion that is very important don't think the caregiver is a bystander no they are part and parcel of that person's life and these are all elements that differ from setting to setting if you don't know these questions the answer to these questions you are going to fail in your discharge planning so in all this when do we start to prepare for discharge can you all put it can you all put it when do we start to prepare for discharge on chat please are you all awake anju are they awake anju kathi do you want to <laughs> respond to that kathi Janvi has replied saying an admission. Very good, Janvi. Very good. Okay. Many of Krima also mentioned. Everyone have to say an admission. Okay, Krima's uh, theoretics. <laughs> okay. All, along. <laughs> all of them have been through the thing. Okay, we start preparing patients for discharge at the moment of admission, and that we do by taking an extensive history, a history and examination first. you invest one and a half to two hours at that admission it's worth it really uh, you take a look at the physical emotional spiritual and mental needs we look at the needs they will have at discharge and then you begin to weave this wonderful tapestry that's by discharge they will have a beautiful tapestry uh, for you to see and they don't have to be re readmitted part of gathering this history is finding out if they have support once they leave the hospital that's very important the basics of discharge plan is evaluation of the patient by a qualified personnel headed by the physician but i'm not saying that he is the be all and end all of it he is the only one who can write discharged on the chart that is why okay the nurse cannot write discharged on our charts i don't know where else in the world that a nurse can discharge but because of that it is headed by the physician he does not have the last say in the matter there's a discussion with the patient and his or her relative you consolidate all the inputs you've got from history examination and your discussions and determine whether caregiver has been trained or some supposing he needs some other support like extra physio coming in that is also needed 
then referral to a home care agency like i said physio nowadays you can get in bigger cities and in velo you can get nurses you can get a social uh, and physiotherapist to come and see the patient and arrange for follow up appointments or tests that is very very important you have to see the patient again after discharge now the components of discharge planning it contains first of all the clinical history diagnostic evaluation you all are very good at this because you all have your abgs at the tip of your fingers your d dimers your ldhs your ferritins your covid testing and rt pcrs and whatever whatever okay and then you would have explained prognosis uh, i know geriatrics explain prognosis and the next thing is dni dnr but it's not always there but everybody thinks of that that way and a management plan and rehabilitation uh, this is all all this constitutes the discharge planning okay prima this is to you because you i can see anybody else any other new uh, geriatric thing on um, any other geriatrics pg prima around nobody else huh? mm -hmm. okay okay krima this is to you what was my mantra i think they have had very less of me on the wards because of covid uh but the mantra this is second year any second year sir no um, or third year okay okay anybody who's passed through geriatrics what is my mantra on the ward no idea <laughs> i don't think so because the most of them ha huh? anju is there huh? anju is there okay anju mole what is my mantra on the ward anju <laughs> roop has written <laughs> <laughs> Anju, Rope isn't your friend, Anju. Sorry to state. <laughs> okay, the mantra on the ward is: take the patient virtually home with you. Take the patient virtually home with you. Okay. So uh, you take the patient and see what all you may need if you take that particular patient to your room or to your uh, um, home with you, and you will see the difficulties you have to uh, face. Now, assessment for safe discharge. Now, this mainly uh, things about the patient's physical ability to follow discharge instructions. I had a patient when I was in a medicine three, uh, a young girl who had TB. she had sputum for positive pulmonary cox and we gave her intensive phase and that was the just the beginning of dot so she had just got the free phase of att at that point of time otherwise rifampicin in those days costed 16 rupees which is very 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 costly at that time so this this girl got dots she came back maybe one and a half months later with very bad tb meningitis so i remember telling dr george john she had drugs free we told her about the drugs and she would do it so what went wrong she said you are only there to give advice to follow it is their uh, their prerogative you cannot force them to do it but then i realized the patient's ability to follow discharge instructions uh, is very very important even a very so how many of you have completed a course of antibiotics i'm sure so many would have missed one or two doses especially if it is qid or even od when you feel is better you'll throw the antibiotic out so remember patients are also human beings and patients also behave like you do and whether they can perform activities of daily living and a support system and financial means to uh, obtain the appropriate follow up care i think you should always look at this financial part of it because uh, especially in patients who are not so good financially and you say you know you there are two treatments one is this a is this and b is that and if you tell them that a is actually better than b according to me but it is so expensive you know how guilty that person's relative will feel to the end of their lives that they couldn't afford it i think you, when you are actually making a decision to tell them about a and b please think what you're fostering on, uh, in them a sense of guilt or a sense of achievement that i have done everything i can for my patient please remember that when you actually give a prognosis when you actually give them a um, choice between a and b now we have a safe for discharge checklist 
that's very good for you all to do see in cmc you have a uh, uh, lot your pampered and spoiled because so many people there are checking your things you know from the what clerk to the everybody checks whatever you are doing then there's now there's been uh, there's even input from the pharmacy uh, to say that what you are doing so medically identify all the multi morbidities rationalize the therapy you can use a pill box for that uh, to keep it friendly see if their cognition is good if not just see that you educate the carer follow up is important you have to look at mobility because we love to see our patients in bed very few times you've actually taken the patient off the bed and taken them for a walk around the ward because so many things can be unearthed with this see if they can actually brush their teeth put on their clothes because of periarthritis shoulder they may not be able to put on their clothes if they diabetes do they have appropriate education inhalers on vaccinations you know our patients on hypoglycemia i think the problem is there they do not understand this at all they they think that something is wrong with the drug you gave them nutrition elimination is very important especially constipation and also we have nocturia going on and whether their home is ready to receive them the caregiver is in place and safety equipment is in there and to schedule the next outpatient visit this is in in short what you would think as a discharge checklist <laughs> what is this uh, anju uh, sorry roop i think you're going to have trouble with anju soon yeah, that's all <laughs> <laughs> okay now this is a checklist that we have prepared in uh, in our uh, in geriatrics you can borrow it if you want it's just to help our nurse to get through the discharge so that she is a check on us she keeps a check on us now the home situation i love this veranda actually to sit out on the charpoy hopefully there are no mosquitoes around but anyway i don't think the village is with mosquitoes hopefully what do you assess of course mobility ease of food preparation and other activities of daily living how are they getting their food okay you can say 1500 calorie diabetic diet blah 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 and give them a beautiful book which comes with a yellow or orange book but then do they have the money to get it and can they actually prepare that food and you know if you have a renal failure diet by any chance anybody knows about this renal failure diet you have to double leach it that means boil it take off the water again boil and take off the water is the most difficult thing to do can they actually do it the home is ready to leave the patient and there's caregiver support and is there access to care now once they go home they have to be very safe i said they you discharge them to a safe haven now for that you need a thorough assessment which may uncover obstacles for recovery that the patient may not even realize could be an issue i'll tell you one thing about uh, we had a patient who had to be in a wheelchair you know what was the problem the wheelchair needs a basic door which is 3 feet in width for the wheelchair to go through the door was not in the in the bathroom so we got stuck there so then we had to uh, modify it and say commode chair then uh, one of our patients we we realized lived in a hut okay you can live it because you live in a hut that's no problem at all she was lying down on a mat so somebody said and she had to use the uh, uh, you know outdoors for for a bathroom because she did not have the money so some of us decided oh we have this commod chair they are going to give her the commod chair she didn't have place to keep the commod chair in the hut so think so what we do you know we actually ask them nowadays everybody has a smartphone so we go through a virtual home visit so we ask them to either photograph or send a video of the front of their house whether they have steps in the house show us your bathroom and things like that so that's called a virtual home visit because we can't visit their homes some of them are very far away and because of the covid situation we actually had to do a lot of things to uh, look at people uh, people's homes finding out who will care for a patient once they go home and what their home setting is like in addition to assessing if they need all these things like physio ot or home health helps us to determine if home is the best place to discharge the patient or not nowadays there are some things called halfway homes that can be used 
okay may, uh, they're just starting out in velo but i'm sure in the bigger cities there are some places like halfway homes that can be used now this is the caregiver the caregiver can be a paid caregiver or it can be a relative of the patient the discharge planners should discuss with the caregivers their willingness and ability to provide care i will tell you a story about this one patient had a stroke she was a lady who had a stroke she was bed bound after that so the man who ha happens to work in cmc velo said uh, i said who is going to look after this patient when she goes home she's had a bad stroke and she was bed bound following the stroke immediately he without hesitation he said my wife so i asked him have you asked her of course he said no i said please remember number one you have to ask her and secondly they have other obligations she had to cook the daughter in law had to cook in the morning tie the tiffin boxes make the plaids for the children and make sure the husband leaves at 7:30 in the morning for work and she had a whole day of work she had nobody to help her and in the evening repeat and how will he or she actually get through this old lady also so please remember do not unless it's you who are volunteering you have to ask the person who is supposed to be care giving for this uh, particular patient and you have the staff have to know about these limitations suppose most of the time when i ask the uh, allied health group tell me who is the carer for this patient they said son i said no chance the son will go to work who is at home with the patient then they'll say daughter in law then i'll say please tell me time table of the daughter in law how to fit it in the son can do lots of things before he leaves so that the daughter in law is not uh, you know burdened with the day lady the whole day including feeding the mother before he goes and then caregivers when they uh, when, when they uh, you know are asked to look for uh, look after the patient have numerous things i have asked the same questions for my mother what is it and what can i expect what is the disease what can i expect is it progressive what should i watch out for what should i be careful about will i need a nurse to help me at home supposing there are some problems what are the red flags what is can i ring up somebody can i what to do for follow up appointments and do we need special instructions regarding food or whether i can allow her to go to the toilet by herself you know so many questions will be there sometimes they even repeat the questions twice or thrice so i ask them whatever questions you have you write down and you ask it at your own pace because for them to assimilate digest what is uh, what is happening it's very difficult remember they are looking at their own kitten kin lying down over there who was walking a few days ago and now he's bed bound or whatever it is restricted mobility or having a severe illness so they are worried and in that worry they are assimilating these things which is very difficult so don't get angry if they want them to, want it to report uh, want want us to repeat it's just that they can't take in that much at that point of time so if you look at discharge process workflow i got this out from the net but i thought it was the closest uh, that we have okay patient is discharged of course by the great consultant and uh, the consultant and the ward staff uh, will prepare all the discharge uh, documents so the discharge summary and the discharge prescription actually ideally the discharge summary should be done the day before the discharge because these are all planned discharges i'm talking about okay discharge process is activated on the hospital system so there is a way the nurses actually after you write discharge they have a program for themselves which goes on to ph uh, pharmacy returns pharmacy drugs to be taken then they have they they have a set, and then to billing they have lots of things that they do relevant documents sent to billing department then pharmacy and the billing staff finalize the hospital bill and unless a uh, uh, billing staff say that the bill has been paid these people will not give the discharge summary there's a huge process actually involved and uh, we had done a run through about this discharge summary a few uh, years ago and actually it was an mts4 for a long time the main the place where it gets stuck is billing and that's 4 hours straight stuck in billing so that is from our point of view now if you look at the patient's point of view 
you see how much is going on in their head patients i mean even patient or carer payment of the bill where am i going to get the money who should i borrow from should i uh, you know pawn my jewelry you know things like that so throughout the discharge throughout the thing please make sure they pay pay small lump sums because the last bill is definitely going to be higher than what is estimated okay understanding or oh, uh, estimated at the last because they add in ppe and a huge number of things that they add in like that understanding a whole lot of medical jargon i told you they have to understand um ramipril is for hypertension and some other pill is for something else so remember we have had four and a half plus three years of medic medicine to understand about ramipril or now those alaskiran so many new things are there okay then they have to realize coordinate transport anybody who has been discharged has to realize there has to be transport coordinate that's not just from uh, bagayan to here or from the uh, our what do you say our uh, quarters to here it is from a village to come here or from somewhere else to come or to fly out from here and remember people have their own beliefs of rahu kalam please respect them in karnataka nobody goes home on wednesday because it is believed if you go home on wednesday you will come back again <laughs> i don't know what better and who will receive them at home so barriers is a lack of time that's the main thing we think we want everything start and instant and a lack of awareness by the hospital team so the care that can be given at home because we are not bothered you know why we are not bothered because uh, the all the things say that it does not uh, uh this good discharge planning does not decrease the financial liability for the uh, health care facility so they're not bothered they're not losing any money if the patient comes again actually they're gaining money poor communication hurried ineffective discharge especially as night when you say that i don't have a bed i have to discharge this patient i literally throw him off the bed and put somebody on the bed that happens in og i don't know if it still happens in medicine okay and a lack of knowledge regarding medication management so there are system policies like staffing shortages especially at night and lack of resources pay, uh, nurses and others not being that to actually explain to them and patient whether their willingness to actually obey the orders and of course they will miss a few instructions they will not uh, when they come for a review they may not do the acpc things like that and transportation family support and finances these are very important so the errors occur because it's a low priority there's a no structured coordinated system which is organizing this discharge summary discharge planning and on top of that even if there's a system the nurses have their own assessment the ot has their own assessment the pt has their own assessment swallow has another assessment of course the doctors are the greatest they have their own assessment and don't look at any of these and lack of interaction and communication among the medical personnel to provide the care please remember holistic care means looking at all angles and problems occur when assessments of future care and support needs are not addressed when there are pending results and you don't look suddenly you say ah, potassium 6 and further non acute care including rehabilitation all that are not looked after home equipment and adaptations are not looked into now this is called fish bone analysis cause and effect i always find it very nice to have this fish bone analysis so what went wrong in my discharge planning there are four main things the physician whether i have not written discharged on time because i ran away to opd the nurse because i have not sent the chart for pharmacy clearance the patient because he hasn't arranged the finances or the transport or rahu kalam came in between and the process and organization pure communication so there are so many arms to it and it looks like a fish bone so these analysis so these arms all of them have to be uh, addressed 40% of patients over 65 had medication errors after leaving the hospital and 18% patients discharged from hospital are readmitted within 30 days so changes should occur please recognize the role of families and caregivers coordinate the care develop better educational material you know i went to uk for a stf and there post stroke literally they had given him 200 a4 sheets of about about stroke 
nobody is going to read that i gather nobody ever read that so please look at the educational material you are pre presenting improve training for the healthcare staff to actually identify red flags and simplify and expand eligibility for public programs like there's so many public programs that are running which the government is funding so now all of you all how many are there 50 huh? 50 50 who shall i ask <laughs> start off ma'am with who anju is going to pick up who's going to answer the first question elvin are you there elvin 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 i think he, i don't i don't remember him coming <laughs> okay i'm first year david david they are all pretending to be asleep i think they all don't be asleep or no kathy are you there kathy kathy <laughs> <laughs> Kathy? No one's responding. <laughs> Ruth Moses? Ah, Ruth. Ruth? I remember Ruth. How was this? Yes, ma'am. Kathy, say Kathy. Yes. Okay, Kathy, this is for you, especially for you. 88-year-old man lives with 84-year-old wife, who's his primary carer. He's educated and financially independent. He has a very loving daughter. and he has been demented for 4 years he's fully dependent on adls for the past 1 year he has been admitted with recurrent episodes of aspiration pneumonia mainly bed bound incontinent and has an unsafe swallow poor nutrition and bed so what's your discharge uh, goals on him don't say dni dnr not acceptable if you can speak out if you want to I think Kathy came during COVID. Yes. Uh, Can I be unmuted? Yeah, unmuted. It's unmuted, Kathy. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, Hi, Kathy. Uh, hmm. for this patient uh, they have uh, they've been admitted with recurrent episodes of aspiration pneumonia and um, it uh, uh, does not have a safe swallow so during the hospitalization you would have probably been on an ng tube uh, so um, we will have to educate the uh, first identify who is the uh, primary caregiver uh, see that is the daughter and whether she is employed and whether she can fit into her daily schedule and she needs to be educated about uh, how to feed the patient via the ng tube and how uh, whether ng feeds are taught to her uh, and secondly uh, 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 the other the other needs of the patient uh, the remaining of his activities of daily living whether whoever is going to take care of uh, whether her daughter herself is going to do all the things that are needed for the patient or whether they're going to have a supplement another person who's uh, helping them out they will also have to be involved uh, in the dis uh, involved um, in the discharge uh, care plan where we'll have to uh, teach them how to care for the patient how to prevent um um uh, 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 how to prevent uh, another uh, episode of aspiration pneumonia and how to uh, prevent a readmission so bed sores are there so obviously this patient has been continuously uh, has been bed bound so uh, uh, we'll have to uh, tell uh, this uh, whether it's the daughter or another person about uh, position changing how to ambulate the patient how to prevent falls uh, how to um, uh, make sure the patient does not develop a urinary tract infection or an infection localized over the bed so um, and also uh, the daughter must be educated about the medication that the patient needs to be on um, what times to give it to she cannot remember to uh, take it themselves the wife is also a very aged person she may also be limited in her activity uh, so uh, it's better that someone uh, 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 monitoring uh, what they do thank you kathy that was very comprehensive um, we had a problem with this patient the daughter just refused a rise to the daughter refused to believe that her uh, father has end stage dementia when they have problems with feeding they stop feeding or they're aspirating it's really end stage dementia the daughter could not take a stomach it that the father was going but you know what she's actually stayed with the person with the patient she, uh, 
she came down from uk she stayed with him for 3 months made sure the bed so um, the bed so disappeared literally and he is still alive one and a half years later and she has never put in a rice stew she makes sure he sits up, i mean he's put up and eats what he likes she said i will not subject my father to a uh, to a bed to a this thing so a, a daughter or a person who really cares sometimes we think they're making wrong decisions because pneumonia is actually a friend of the demented but uh, but it gives that daughter immense satisfaction to look after that that father of hers and she's done a good job one and a half year uh, 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 years later he is not come back to hospital so she's actually kept him quite good but what you said is right but when this uh, ng tube does not decrease the mor morbidity or the mortality in end stage dementia please remember that okay next one who shall we do anju ruth ruth moses are you there ruth and janvi janvi yeah ruth is there na no? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Ruth. This is for you. Seventy-three-year-old male widower. PET scan shows diffuse met bony metastasis. Uh, in pain, mostly bedbound after a fall. The carers are daughters who live nearby, and prior to admission, had a lady cooking and cleaning for him. So, can you give some inputs on how to discharge plan him? Uh, yes, ma'am. Janvi here, not Ruth, ma'am. Yeah, Janvi. Thanks, Janvi. Okay. Um, she came in recently. This one. Tell me. Uh, ma'am uh, one thing uh, the most important thing i think is uh, the fact that he is in pain and uh, we have to uh, plan on how to manage the pain uh, um in terms of whether he needs um uh, opioids um and how much that is going to uh, affect his uh, quality of living now that he is uh, bed bound and um, whether he is going to become drowsy or uh, how dependent he is going to become uh, with the uh, level of uh, opioid or pain uh, pain medication that he needs so that will be uh, that will need to be assessed in the ward and then we'll have to identify the uh, primary caregiver because with the fall and the pain that he has his uh, um dependency is likely to increase now so um, which of the daughters if one of them is going to be taking care of him or whether the uh, employed um, uh, carer uh, the lady who was cooking and cleaning whether she is going to be uh, taking care, uh, care of him they need to be uh, brought in and uh, we need to uh, train them on uh, managing a bed bound patient in terms of prevention of bed sore and um, uh, care and cleaning uh, and position change uh, as well as administration of uh, med medications that he needs um uh, i think uh, that's it ma'am and also Thank we need to discuss uh, with the family uh, in case of his uh, underlying illness like um uh, the uh, we have to plan on how, what extent of pain medication and opioid we're giving whether we're just going to keep him comfortable or whether they want him to have a good enough uh, sensorium okay thanks janavi that was also very comprehensive um, uh, i just want to tell you uh, thing is these people are very lonely okay and this this diagnosis may have come as a shock to this particular patient pain is the first thing you must manage and the secondly the daughters because these are also end stage things bleeding palliative care uh, please note you'll have to know the who pain ladder you have to know the who pain ladder there's so many things that you can give for pain but and including patches but most of them cause constipation so please be careful of that and uh, they have he has to now he's become from a, a, a person who used to walk and who could stay alone in the, his house he's become a bed bound patient so he will need 24 by 7 care and uh, something has to be done to actually make sure that he is never left alone and uh, unlikely uh, the other thing is about feeding when to feed when he's uh, depends on how he is how uh, awake he is we can also teach him subcutaneous fluids uh, the worst thing about uh, these people who are drowsy is thirst so if you can give him 500 ml uh, subcutaneous fluids which is very easy you can learn it from any of our nurses actually it's beautifully done through a uh, butterfly needle uh, you can give 500 ml each thigh or even at the back you can give or even on the abdomen so they are actually the thirst is kept away they can tolerate hunger but thirst is a very horrible thing for these end stage people okay thanks janavi okay 
Who's going to do this for me? Susan. Susan. Are you awake or are you close by? Shreya. Roop Solomon. Roop. Yes, Roop. Come, come. Since since you were trying to get get hold of Anju, Roop. Well, he's not right. there. He's he, Anju must have done away with him, I think. <laughs> Lissy, Lissy, are you there? Lissy, yeah. Uh, somebody's oh, come. Susan, 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 can you unmute her? Susan, you unmuted. This is a seventy-two-year-old lady who lives in an old-age home. Basically, it's a room with a bathroom and a small kitchenette on the first floor. There are three such rooms. She's financially independent, and her adopted son, when he was she was on the ward, came and took a check for one lakh, saying that was the bill. highly unlikely to be a bit for 3 days in the ward she was admitted for decreased mobility after a fall and she had urinary tract infection leading to her decreased uh, leading to the i mean that was a primary underlying problem so uh, who's this susan susan yeah go ahead susan you are unmuted is not unmuted she saying No, she's. Susan, are you there? Can I be unmuted? Okay, Susan, we can't hear you very well because I think there's a problem with your net. What okay, uh, Shreya, Thomas, Thomas, this first year, Pranit. Still, I think they are not coming at all. Prabhu, Ranju, yes, ma'am. Who is that? Hmm. I'm seventy two. Um, this lady. Ah. Ah. Hello, ma'am. Yes, carry on. <coughs> go on. Is it Susan? Please go on. There is an issue. Yeah, you are. Go ahead. Okay, I'll finish this for you all. Uh, we actually treated her urinary infection, and the occupational therapist and the physiotherapist worked on her. Basically, it's a first floor room which had twenty steps. and if anybody have visited mts4 we have a window to the sky literally where you climb up those steps so the ot actually took her up and down those steps so by the time 14 days of iv antibiotics were over she could actually climb up and down the stairs and uh, it's a nice story because uh, her adopted son actually uh, she realized what the bill was and realized that he was uh, uh, abusing her uh, as monetary abuse and um, she got a little bit more uh, what do you say wise during this time and um uh three weeks later our ot actually went and visited her and she was in a very good mood and she made him nice hot hot bhajis so if you want to have a good <laughs> uh, hot bhajis you know where to go just contact our ot he'll tell you mm -hmm. okay uh so there's a maintenance and welfare of parents and senior citizens amendment bill in 2018 before it child means only child Okay. Now the amendment includes daughter-in-law, son-in-law, minor through a guardian, a relative of a childless senior citizen. So that's what he was. And look at that imprisonment to three months. She was told of this deadly act. But remember, in all this, no, no mother, however hurt she is, will tell, will give her son up to the police. So please remember that. And I don't know how many of you all are actually ringing up your parents every day. to just say hi it makes a big difference in their lives so at least from now on just to say hi any time you're free they i'm sure they won't say i'm sleeping and slam down the phone no they'd love to hear your voice okay the last one i think this 62 year old lady lives with son and his family she has uncontrolled hypertension cognitively intact and requires numerous antihypertensives at different times to keep her bp under control I'll tell you something. Before, no, I was actually giving this BP drugs one at six a.m. and six p.m., one at seven a.m. and seven p.m., then one at ten a.m. and something like that. And I realized, you know, 
it is very difficult for a patient to have that. So at the most, they can take two sets of drugs in the morning at different times, and at the most two sets in the night. And for this patient, I think you should do that. And also remember, all these patients are salt sensitive. So a little amount of increase in salt will chuck the BP out, up. And remember, they may be having stressors, which may also lead to high BP. So please address all these things. And the third one is say, uh, I remember saying four gram salt, I don't know, I'll never want to eat that thing with four gram salt. Dr. AMC used to say, normal salt in diet, no added salt, no aplam, no urka. That's what he used to say. Because we need that amount of salt because we are in a wonderfully hot place called CMC Velo. Okay. And uh, please note that this one would do well with a pill box again. Okay. Now, this one is actually somebody very dear to me. She, uh, I, she literally, I mean, I grew up with her. She was a maid in my house. She's a 64 year old widow who lives, lived alone. Uh, her widowed sisters and their family lived nearby. She was recently shifted to her daughter's home in a different state that she came to CMC, uh, to Velo, in view of ill health. Basically, she had dental abscesses and tight mitral stenosis with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. She was initiated on warfarin and she had osteoarthritis of the knees. So she had a lot of not only physical problems, she had to be initiated on warfarin, which was actually very difficult for her to comprehend. She was not that well educated and she had a problem with her daughter actually um, harassing her. So she had so many things. And the, what we did first was remove her, uh, those, the clear the dental things, put her, put her on warfarin, gave her physio for the knee and um, uh, rationalized her drugs. She also had mild diabetes, which was controlled with diet alone. The thing is for these people, please remember with all these prescriptions, you're also supposed to listen to their tale of woe. They have very sad stories, you know, all of them. You should be so happy that you are in such a wonderful, uh, you know, family that you've been brought up. So discharge planning in a nutshell. Begin planning discharge uh, for discharge at admission. Establish whether the patient has simple, simple need means like what you have in medicine. Patient came with uh, typhoid and young man, no comorbidities, went home after treatment. That's a simple discharge. But our discharges have physical, mental, emotional, all those are complex needs which need to be addressed. Develop a treatment plan. So this is where your plan of care which you all are supposed to write. That is called problem sheet for you all, I think. Do you all still write it or it's uh, omitted? Okay, so that's very important that you all write it. Then set up an estimated date. It may be plus minus, but an estimated date is very important so that you work to a schedule, the goals of the PT and OT work to the schedule and the patient is mentally prepared to leave. But now this has become easier because when you have that admission sheet itself, this is explain uh, that uh, what do you say explain the money and explain the time remember those two things that we have to take in the admission order sheet itself you have to work together to pro pro provide a comprehensive plan with your team then inform carers you also have to take the thing of the carers and the patient into mind and review the care plan because suddenly what will happen they may have an mi which throws you a balance they may have an upper gi bleed so review the care plan every day for each patient and use a discharge checklist. And finally, you will get an effective discharge plan. So successful discharge is when the patient is happy, the carer is happy and you're happy to say bye. Sometimes the other two are not so good thing, but you're very happy to see some patients going, going away because they have, according to us, they have been such bugs, okay? But I guess it stems from a very uh, in-depth in hurt that they have. So in conclusion, discharge planning is a complex activity. It is very nice. It is uh, like Sherlock Holmes running around to find who the murderer is. Okay, this effective discharge planning is crucial to ensure timely discharge and continuity of care and helps the he healthcare providers to use their limited resources most effectively and avoids unnecessary admissions. So this is the main conclusion. So. I'm sure you recognize the last picture, but I'll tell you that later. When you were younger, 
uh, when you read fairy tales or when you read Harry Potter, Aladdin, uh, Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella, or any of Harry Potter, the, actually the pages came out with you. So you became so involved in that book. That involvement must be there. So even this present test match that India won, you were so involved in that, you know, that I'm sure till today, all of us go back and look at highlights because it's something that we cherish. That's something that every Indian loved that particular day when Rishabh Pant actually hit that winning run. So it was such a, you know, a miracle. In that same way, when you see an effective discharge planning, that same miracle you see every day on your words, that smile from that patient is actually, you cannot even put a, a million dollars on it. It's worth much more than that. They become your friends. They are not a number. They are not a serum creatinine. So as you go through life, you will think this is a very, uh, very insignificant topic for your uh, planning, I mean, for your exam. But this is what you do day in and day out. And remember, don't forget to acknowledge that smile that they have on their faces because that's the best reward that you can get. So all the best in your careers and God bless you. I hope you enjoyed geriatrics lectures. Thank you. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Uh, that was a very, very meaningful lecture to all of us. I think it, it really meant, the, uh, it was really essential in the sense that it has been taken for all of us, especially in the budding stage of all PGs who have been well, to enter the uh, consultant area, where you'll end up being all the more like being formal with patients, where you need to show off to others how to be caring, caring for the patients. Two things like how you want to comment on that, ma'am, that's the fact that you, when you told about uh, communication part that was uh, with respect to at least taking, though it's a job of sisters or nurses or maybe interns, I think it starts to start off from the consultant PG levels to have this five second, five minutes taken out of for the final day at least to read through, go through. That means someone should be ready when before, way before. And going through the research prescriptions to know what is what and which medication means what. I mean, then many of them, when you have this polypharmacy, uh, gives more uh, weightage to all this shiny multivitamin vitamin tablets which looks more important to them and ends up missing on other drugs. Yeah. So it makes a lot of difference and also telling when to come and giving making all get ready before even going back, going home. That's one thing and also updating the bill on, on a daily or a two to day two to three day basis. I mean they're easier for us also and also the patients because they need to know that where, where they stand. So they also can make plans towards discharge where they stand far away from discharge or it's more way more to go and also getting things ready at home. It's all meant to all at the last moment, getting, I mean, wanting to go home I and mean, requiring to go home and nothing being made ready at home. So I think, ma'am, that I think this is an eye opener to all of us. And uh, thanks a lot for arranging all those four lectures for us from geriatrics. And um, hope if you have any questions, you can ask now. Someone has put up saying, grateful to you again for reminding me to smile and listen carefully without looking at my phone while talking to patients. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I do that too also sometimes. Thanks. <laughs> Anyways, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we'll upload this lecture soon in our Department of Medicine YouTube website. Um, that's the end of our geriatric lectures. Now, next week, we'll, uh, coming Friday, we'll have a lecture by Dr. Nihal Thomas, uh, um, endocrine, and then we have other subsequent lectures after geriatrics from a pediatric starting on from next Monday. So it's an ongoing lecture series for the next two, three months. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Anju. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you.